Um, uh, in a previous season of my life, I, um, I used to take time out from my business uh, and I used to go and travel to different parts of New Zealand to run financial seminars. Many of you know the story. Um, it was part of what I did. It was part of my personal mission, as I would call it. And then after a while, that kind of came to an end. And I was in a season, and I knew I was in a transition, but I had nothing to do. There was uh, no open doors, no business, and literally, the Lord said to me, I'm putting you on gardening leave. And I had, to, I had to do that. Nothing to do. But then, you know, the Lord works with coincidences. Out of the blue, I say out of the blue, a guy phones me, a guy from Auckland phones me, said, I need to come and see you. Uh, as an organization, we run financial seminars. I've heard, I've heard about you, and I need your help. And for the next two years, I contracted to this organization, and I traveled from the top of the North Island to the bottom of the South Island doing financial seminars for them. And over 12 months, in the space of 12 months, I was in over 60 churches across New Zealand running these seminars. And it was, it was in this experience of this traveling that I was doing and being in so many different locations from large churches to small churches that the Lord opened up my mind, but more importantly, opened up my heart to the deep needs that are inside the local church of New Zealand. But it also, as we were doing these seminars as outreach, it also cemented my driving passion for the local church to be the demonstration of God's love Amen. to meet the deep needs that are in the community. Amen. And then out of the blue, as a coincidence, the Lord invited me to Tiamudu to lead a local church. So in 2015, we came south, and the Lord gave us this mission statement, which is to activate community transformation. Isn't it funny how the Lord has a purpose in his pathway always for us? Always. So let me ask you the question that you might internalize it and personalize it for yourself. Does the Lord launch his people on a journey so he can leave them stranded in the wilderness? Still no. For those of you on a journey, for those of you that have been on a journey with us, we've got to accept the Lord has a purpose in this. Across the globe, for the last three years, it would be fair to observe that the church and, in fact, society has been on this uh, tumultuous roller coaster ride that we would just call 2020, 2021, 2022. You can call it what you like. Uh, it's got many names. Uh, but funny enough, at the same time, our church has been on a journey that started in 2020, went through a few dips and a few highs in 21 and 22, we started to get some clarity. And I firmly believe that the Lord has led us to this place, here, this physical place, in order that we would begin to establish his kingdom in our community as we go out from the hub. Now, just for definition, when I say... Um, that we would establish his kingdom, just a simple definition, God's kingdom is the dominion of the king. That's what kingdom means, right? The kingdom is the dominion of the king. What does dominion mean? The rule and reign of the king, the monarch. Who's the king? Just checking. So, so, so the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of King Jesus in our realm. So when we say, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we're saying, Jesus, may your rule and reign that is in heaven be here now. But if you pray that prayer, be careful, because he's saying it's going to come through you, through us, through the ecclesia, through the people of God. So what does this mean for you? Because it's easy to talk about mission statements, and it's easy to talk about the journey, but you're sitting in your chair, and you're going, well, what, what the heck does this mean for me. Well, as always, you, you get the choice. you got an opportunity to make a choice, to make a decision. Who do you want to be in the story? God's writing a story. Well, in fact, he's written it, but it's unfolding before us. But all the way along, you get to choose who you're going to be in that story. And I'm going to, I'm going to put some questions out there today. 
And as you take those questions away and as you consider those questions, you get to make some choices about what that looks like for you. I'm going to ask you to give me some grace today because I'm kind of, I'm serving up a full platter and I'm going to do my best to get it to you in uh, digestible pieces. But this is the final message in a series, so I've got to wrap it up as well as point you in the right direction. So there's five things, five things I'm going to do today. First of all, I'm going to point backwards in order to point you forwards. We're going to look backwards so that you can look forwards. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a couple of insights that I see and I'm going to plant them in your heart. Thirdly, I've got a warning for some of you. I'm also going to acknowledge the pain and the risk that comes from being vulnerable before God. And finally, we'll finish with that key question that you're going to take home. So as I said, this is a wrap-up message. It's the final in a series that we've called Crossing Over. And uh, we've literally, we talked about this, we crossed the Mungapiko stream. That was our Jordan. We walked over here to our new location, which is what we're calling the new land. And, and so we're crossing over. And this final message, the title was this, Your Promise is Your Mission. Your Promise is Your Mission. And I'll explain what that means as we go. So let me start at the beginning by looking backwards so that we can point forwards. As a church, we've been on a journey, and it all started in 2020 in a prayer meeting. Now, again, I cannot, you're going to hear me like a scratch record um, for the rest of the year. I cannot stress enough how important prayer meetings are. Yes, your personal prayer is vital. Make sure you've got a devotion to prayer, whether it's yelling at the Lord in the car or kneeling beside your bed like Smith Wigglesworth used to do. Whatever you do, have a prayer life. But corporate prayer is vital, and in fact, prayer is what leads this church. And in 2020, the Lord gave us this key scripture that launched us on this journey of crossing over. Not the series of crossing over, the journey. In Joshua 3 verse 5, Joshua said to the people, Purify yourselves, for tomorrow you will see the Lord do wonders amongst you. And this was deeply convicting to us, and it challenged us, and we started looking around that passage, and we started realizing the Lord was calling us out and across to a new space. And so that's what we've called the crossing over season. And we've crossed over. And so we've done this series, and I just want to recap it because it's worth review, but it's worth you taking the responsibility to review it for yourself. And we put all our messages up on YouTube, and on Spotify, and they're there for you so you can go back and review some of the key things that you want to refresh on. I myself go and listen to messages that are shared in this church because I need the review and I need the reminder and I need to stir myself to faith in action. Sometimes for me, repetition is the only way it gets in. And if you can't find YouTube or Spotify, let me know and I'll find another way to help you. We started off, we spoke a message about Elijah and Elisha, and the message is called Old Yoke, New Mantle, but it challenged you to think about what are you going to pick up as Elisha. We filled in some worksheets. Now, those messages aren't recorded, but we talked about the importance of establishing monuments in the journey. The monuments point people to God. We had to decide, do we want to be a good church or do we want to be a glorious church filled with the glory of Jesus? Phil spoke about the importance of renewing the covenant, which is the first step in crossing after you've crossed over. We looked at the Battle of Jericho, which actually isn't a battle. And, and um, Nigel and Marge and, and Louise shared about Jericho. And they reminded us that, uh, that obedience is, is essential. The power, there's power in our silence. And God's given us a responsibility to pull down strongholds in our city today. And you can find that online. And then we get to the point where I want to share what God said to me last year. God said to me late last year, advance into the land I'm giving you and occupy your promise. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But in late 2022, I felt the Lord say this, advance into the land I'm giving you and occupy your promise. Now you have to understand, we're on the back end of three years of the hardest season I think I've ever walked through, certainly in church life. 
most people were messed upside down. They didn't know which way was up. They, they'd made decisions. They had to remake decisions. They didn't know if they were part of this clique or part of that clique or were they able to travel, were they able to go to their friends. There was a whole lot of mess going on. And what had happened is we'd retreated into isolation. We'd actually closed the door in our cave and we were quite happy to stay there. We were used to hiding and we were quite comfortable hiding. And then I hear the Lord say, Advance. And I'm like, oi, oi, oi. I don't feel like that. I'm quite happy in my slippers at home, thanks, doing church online. Yeah. And the Lord says, advance. So I wrestled with it. And, and, I, and I brought it before the elders. And I was like, guys, I'll, I'll read to you this in a minute. But I, I also posted a message on YouTube in January 2023. And it's called Occupy Your Promise. I did put it up on the social channels this week. Um, I would recommend watching it. It's only 25 minutes, but you can see now the timeline that God's been using for us to get to this point to launch us into this next phase of our journey. But as I was preparing myself myself for this message, I went back and I read a a report that I wrote to the elders. Because every month, most months, I, I publish a report for the elders. And there's a section in February's report from this year, and I want to read it to you. And it's under the heading, Advance and Occupy, in my elders' report. Let me read it to you. In early 2023, I published a message called Occupy Your Promise, in which I shared that I felt the Lord saying it was time for us to adopt a posture of advance and occupy, taken from the Lord's instructions to Joshua and the Israelites in the book of Joshua. It is important for the eldership of the church to pray, discuss and discern if this is a now word for Zion and its people. In essence, I've been led to this point as a result of the numerous prayer meetings, get the memo, the numerous prayer meetings in late 22 where we prayed scripture of this nature. And I've highlighted three scriptures. I'm going to read them to you. Joshua 3 verse 10. Today, the Lord says, Today you will know the living God is among you. He will surely, 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 we just heard that song. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and Jebusites ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you to cross over. The second passage, if you're writing notes, is Isaiah Where's Isaiah gone? He's slopped out of the Bible. (coughs) Just before, just before my... Isaiah 54, verse 2 and 3. You'll probably recognize this one. The Lord says, Enlarge your house, build an addition, spread out your home, and spare no expense, for you will soon be bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm, Looks like it. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. The Lord said to us in that prayer meeting, it was time to stretch out our tent pegs. And finally, the verse that we open today with Joshua 1 verse 3, the Lord says, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. My elders report continues. Do we believe the Lord is leading us into a new space where we will establish his kingdom? As his ambassadors, are we not commissioned to occupy the promises God has given us? What does this look like externally? Do we believe the Lord will lead us to a new land, like as in dirt, that he has prepared for our future? And if so, when we stand on it, will we lay claim to it? as Joshua and Caleb did. If the resolve is not strong in the leaders, it will not settle in the people. A review of Numbers chapter 14 would be timely for us. But we must consider what this looks like internally. Could it be such that the Lord is looking for us to advance and occupy the internal freedom and peace that he's promised for his people? Is it possible that we must include emotionally healthy discipleship as a promise of the Lord for us to possess? If so... We must lead the people in this. As always, I submit myself to eldership that we might wrestle with revelation in order to come 
to a shared amen. And so we wrestled with it. But I don't want, to miss, I don't want you to miss the key phrase from that reading. Listen to this. As his ambassadors, we, as his ambassadors, are we not commissioned to occupy the promises he's given us? I think the Lord's spoken very, very, very clearly to us. I think the Lord set it out before us. And now what I'm inviting us to do as a collective, as a church family, is to set our hearts on what God has said in order that we may move forward together. So that's what I mean when I say we need to look backwards in order that we would point ourselves forward. The second thing I promised you is that I would share some things that I've seen. And so I've been cheating, I've got to say, and I've been reading ahead in the story. Like, it's, it's, it's easy, because I just, I just keep reading the book of Joshua. Because the season that we've been in and the teaching series of Crossing Over has been literally the first six chapters of Joshua. So you can do your own review. But I decided to read ahead and see what, what might be coming. And I've just got a couple of things I want to highlight to you. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. On the day the Lord gave on the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people. He said, "Let the sun stand still over Gibeon, and the moon over the valley of somewhere." So the sun stood still. Oh my gosh. Sun Stand still. Like, I don't know what that means for us, but I'm just lobbing that out there as a prophetic utterance that you might create some holy anticipation and have an expectation to see what God's going to do to literally make the sun stand still for us. In Joshua 13, I turned the page on a different day and I read Joshua 13 verse 6 and it starts to get into the allocation, which is not easy reading, but, but in, in the second half of verse 6, the Lord says this, I myself, says the Lord, will drive these people out of the land ahead of you. The Lord says, I will drive the people out ahead of you. I will make the way open. And again, I actually don't know what that looks like, but I'm lobbing it out there as a seed. I'm putting a seed, two prophetic seeds in your hand, and you can choose what you do with them. But perhaps we would ask the Holy Spirit to cultivate those seeds in us that we'd have an anticipation of what God's going to do. Because God always speaks to us before he leads us. Thirdly, I said I I I felt to prepare a warning for some of you. Um... This, this, this is a warning because there are, there's a risk that there's an enemy within that will seek to drive us away from God's promise. More than that, the enemy could be within you or it could be within the person next to you. Just have a look. You're not looking. Are you too scared to look? Bill, did you look? Uh-huh. Now, <laughs> what you didn't hear me say is that the person next to you is the devil. I did not say that. So do not quote me as saying that. So the person next to you is not the enemy of your soul. You can breathe a sigh of relief and so can they. But we do know that the enemy of our soul is the devil, and we know the devil is, is crawling and sneaking around, prowling like a lion, seeking to find a weakness that he can exploit so that he can destroy us. Is that not true? Okay, so if that's true, then we've got to be careful. Even Jesus had to deal with this. He's telling his disciples, guys, I've got to die, and I have to be buried, and then... I'm going to be resurrected. And Peter goes, oh, no, Lord. I will never allow that to happen. And what did did Jesus say? Get 
behind me, Satan. And then he says, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but human concerns. So be careful. Because in the journey to the promised land, the enemy could be within you, or it could be within someone close to you. We see it in the journey to the promised land. In the promised land, the people of God um, are traveling on their way to the promised land, sorry, and they have this opportunity to walk right into it. And so they're like, let's go have a look and make sure it's okay. And they sent 12 spies in to have a look at the promised land. And they tripped over. It's right there. And they tripped over because of the enemy within. They ended up doing a 40-year lap around the wasteland in the wilderness because they tripped over, and it was right there. So let's read about that. Numbers 13, the end end of Numbers 13. uh, Let me just read, starting verse 21. So they, the spies, went up and explored the land from the wilderness from here to there, going north. In verse 23, it says, They came to the valley of Echol. They, They cut down a branch of a single cluster of grapes, so large it took two of them to carry. Anyone else got grapes like that? So the promised land was really, really good. But then, if you turn the page to verse 27, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. So good, good so far. But the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified, and we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. What's my first warning to you? Beware of negative Nancys. I'm giving you permission to disagree with negative Nancys. Firmly disagree with anyone who speaks in the opposite to the promise of God. And I'll show you why at the beginning of Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verse 1, says this. The whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Would it be better for us to return to Egypt? They plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader. See what happens when you listen to negative Nancys? You open the door to fear. And instead of faith rising, fear takes over. And so this is why we've got to shut down anything that would come to destroy or steal what God has promised. Now, I can tell you, one of the privileges of my role is I get to have lots of conversations with Nancy's. (laughs) They try to tell me it's too difficult to take the church on a journey like this, especially recovering from some of the stuff we've been through. They tried to tell me that we should stay in the old building because there's always been a building on that corner. They tried to tell me we should meet in the building every Sunday like we've always done since we ever started. They tried to tell me that we should not spend money to make a safe place for people to find Jesus. Well, thank you, Nancy. Now look, it's my job to have those conversations. It's part of my deal. And when someone speaks in wisdom, we listen in wisdom. But when someone speaks in the wrong spirit, I will not tolerate something that opposes what God has said that is going to birth fear in the people so that they complain and they ask if they can die in bondage. Not on my watch. So be careful. Eve, listen to the serpent. And Adam, listen to Eve. So be very, very careful who you listen to because people get used to plant seeds of doubt. And and if you can deal with doubt, good on you. But doubt often rises up fear. And fear is a spirit. And a spirit will shut down what God is doing. So when I get fronted by stuff like that, 
Firstly, I have an eldership that I go to because that's my counsel. Secondly, I'm filtering these things and I ask this one question which might help you. What do I know God has said? If ever I'm wondering what on earth is going on around me, I turn around and I look backwards to ask myself, what do I know God has said? And that's what locks it in. Jesus was tempted by the devil. You're going to be tempted by the devil. It's called the walk of faith. It's called the walk of Jesus. But every time the devil threw something at Jesus, he answered it with Scripture. What has God said? Mm. The fourth thing I want to do today, I'm serving up a buffet for you. The the fourth thing I want to do is I want to acknowledge... I really felt the Lord challenged me on this because um, I'm someone that loves change. Like I, I, I thrive on new and exciting mountains. Um, but I felt like the Lord say, I really want you to acknowledge that change is scary. Change requires vulnerability. And vulnerability is scary. And, and, and here's the thing. Not every question has an answer. Some of you come to me asking about the thing on the wall that's not there. Again, I apologize to the people down the side, but um, it's not there. And I just shrug. I go, I don't have an answer. I'm sorry it's not there, and I'm fighting for it. But I don't have an answer to every question. But some people, that's scary. And, 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 And uncertainty forces us into a place of vulnerability. And again, for some people, being vulnerable is scary. And did you, let, me, let me help you out with this. Did you know that when you're in a position of vulnerability, it triggers something psychological in your head that you can't control? Because you're a human being. And, and scientists will tell us that the, that the center of your brain, they actually, there's a guy, I can't quote his name, but they call this processing center right in the middle your reptilian brain. No, I'm not saying you're a dinosaur or a lizard. It's just called the reptilian brain. Some of us are dinosaurs, but very few. But the reptilian brain is what drives your natural human instinct instinct to either fight or flight. It's right in the center of your brain, and if you've got a brain, you've got the reptilian center in there. Now, now this is really, really helpful in the days of the caveman. Because when the bear or the lion turned up and they were confronted into a vulnerable position, they knew they either had to fight or flight. So your reptilian brain is actually given you to you to drive your survival. But listen to this. As I was doing some research on this, the reptilian brain thinks from a place of fear and acts on impulse. So your reptilian brain bypasses your neocortex, which is your logical processing center. It's where you rationalize things. It's where you slow things down. It's where you think about it and put it into the big picture. When your reptilian brain kicks in, you're either fight or flight, and you're not thinking. Now, in the caveman days, as I said to you, it started with a threat to physical safety. But let me make a proposition to you these days in our modern world. I would suggest to you that the reptilian brain of the modern New Zealand person kicks in when there's a threat to your comfort. And when it's triggered, your whole system of thinking is bypassed, which means you've got to take charge. You have to take charge. And the best way you can do that is to remember that God give you, gave you an amazing gift to deal with it. And we're going to spell it so everyone gets it. F A I T H. The best gift that you could have to overcome your reptilian brain. But you've got to remember faith in what is seen is not actually faith. So faith is needed when you can't see. Jesus, talking to Thomas in John chapter 20, 
He's like, fine, Thomas finally gets it. He's like, oh, you're God. And Jesus said to him, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe me without seeing me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. You love him, though you have never seen him, though you do not see him. You trust him and rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting in him will be the salvation of your souls. What's the gift that you have to overcome your reptilian brain? Faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, you know this well. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Verse 6, if it, it is impossible to please God without... What, what, it's possible to please God without? Faith. Faith. So, so what I'm trying to do is acknowledge that we are called into a place of vulnerability. We're called into that place, and sometimes that's scary, but always that requires faith. And I can assure you, and I think everyone here would testify to looking around the room, we're all relatively mature, adults, give or take a few. <laughs> but the Lord's going to lead us out of our comfort zone. Anyone, anyone know that? Yeah. The Lord's going to lead us out of our comfort zone to develop our faith. That's how it works. But thank the Lord, He doesn't call us to do it alone. Because I've done seasons on my own, and it's hard. But the Lord calls us to walk inside a faith community so we can gain strength from each other. And I've said this for years, but we've got to understand that the Lord calls us to be connected because that's the way He, he knows we can cope best. But we've, got to, we've still got to acknowledge our feelings. If you're feeling scared, if you're feeling uncertain, if you're feeling vulnerable, if you're feeling like you don't know or you're confused, just own it. Don't hide it. Because one of the things I've had to learn in my journey is that emotions are signposts that God uses to point to something he wants to show you. So why am I feeling uncertain? Why am I feeling confused? Why am I feeling vulnerable? And the Lord says, oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you something. And whether it's something he needs to heal or it's something he needs to reveal, sometimes those emotions are the signposts that God uses. So acknowledge the feeling, surrender it to God, and stand with a prayer friend and ask the Lord to do the work he wants to do. And for goodness sake, do not allow the devil to trick you into being isolated. Oh my gosh, it's, the, it's almost like the only play he's got in his book to break down family is isolation. He'll trick you into thinking that you're the only one going through it and you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to be vulnerable because everyone's going to laugh at you and you should be older than, you should be wiser than this by now. And he said, you just hide at home, don't go to church because then you don't have to expose yourself to anybody. Or don't go to your connect group because you really don't want them to know what's going on. Or don't tell anyone the problems you're having. It's the devil. Isolation is his only play and don't allow it. Okay. All right, that was my introduction, finished. So um, what we've done, uh, no, seriously, what we've done is we've looked backwards so that we can look forwards. We've heard a couple of prophetic words that we're going to take home and, and, and stew on and ask the Holy Spirit to stir something in us. We've heard a couple of warnings, and I won't repeat those warnings. You can listen to them back on the podcast. And we've also acknowledged that it might be scary or uncertain, but we should remain connected. All of that to lead us to the main point of today's message, which is really the landing, it's the key question, it's the, it's the theme, it's the takeaway that, that I want you to, to, to consider. Because the title of today's message is Your Promise is Your Mission. And your promise being your mission comes out of this, this theme that God gave me that we need to advance Crossover, we need to advance and occupy the territory, which essentially means your kingdom, God, come where I am. Okay? So the question I've got for you is what does it look like to occupy? What does it look like to occupy 
So, so, so you would personalize that question. You say, what does it look like for me to occupy God's promise? What does it look like for me? You know, we're in the pre-service prayer meeting this morning. We're praying for you. We're praying for the church. We're praying for all the churches. But we're praying that in this new season, there's a new mindset God gives us to see things differently. Because when you stand in a new place, you have a different perspective. And a different perspective often requires a different way of processing things. Your promise is your mission. And so this is the moment where you get to choose who you're going to be in the story. And I've got some examples for you. Not exclusive, they're just a couple of examples, but really it's around you choosing who you're going to be in the story. Joshua chapter 1, we started with this reading, I'm going to read it again, Joshua chapter 1 verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Actually that came up in the prayer as well, where's Tom? You know, new season, the old has passed, the old has gone, the new has come, Moses is dead. What that means is there's a dying of the old season to move into the new season. Moses is dead, therefore the time has come to lead the people. So perhaps you're Joshua. Perhaps you're in the story, you're going to be written into the story as Joshua. And it's time to lead the people across the Jordan into the land. I promise you what I promised Moses, wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I've given you. From the south to the north, from the high point to the low point, in the west and to the east, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you. Says the Lord, I will not fail you and I will not abandon you. Some of you already know what your assignment is. And I know that because I've journeyed with you and I've heard the Lord speak to you. And I've, I've, some of you have even sat and had meals or coffees or, or chats or prayer times around what God's given you as an assignment. But are you ready to complete it? Are you ready to walk in it? You know, it wasn't easy for Joshua, but he was standing on the shoulders of Moses. We're all standing on the shoulders of someone who went before us. Maybe you choose to be Joshua. Or maybe, currently, maybe you're Achan. Only one of you is concerned about that possibility. You know who Achan was? He was the guy who took the silver from Jericho and hid it. In Joshua 7 verse 20, Achan replied when they found out who it was because they lost the battle and God was like, well, you've got some poison in you, you've got idols. And Achan said, it's true, I've sinned against the Lord. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 20 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They're hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. Look, there's one thing I'm certain of because God said it numerous times. This is a season we need to purify ourselves. And it started way back in 2020 when God spoke out of Joshua 3 verse 5 says this. Consecrate yourself. Purify yourself. For tomorrow you will see the Lord do wonders amongst you. Man, we've been on a journey. We've been asking the Lord to purge us. We've been asking the Lord to clean us. We've been pulling down strongholds. We've been burning idols. We've been letting the past lie in the past. But this is a personal call to every single one of us to make sure our heart is right before God. I'm not judging anybody. I'm calling out what's necessary for the season. Maybe in the story, maybe you're Caleb. Maybe you're Caleb. Now looking around at the number of silver heads we have in the room, there's probably a few Calebs. And I'll explain why. First of all, Caleb was one that went into the promised land and said, hey, look, we can go and we can take it. You can read that in in Numbers 13. But 40 years later, he's still standing there with Joshua. Hence the silver hair. Listen to this, Joshua 14 verse 10. Caleb says this, Now as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. Even while Israel wandered in the wilderness. He was one of the only two that didn't die out of that generation. Today, Caleb says, I am 85 years old. 
Don't you dare tell me age is a reason you can't do your assignment. The Lord has an assignment for everyone because here's what Caleb says. Now give me my mountain, my inheritance, the land which you've given me, you've promised me to occupy. Give me my mountain, says Caleb, that I might dwell there and thrive there. If you're Caleb, the Lord's calling you into the community to bring influence. Maybe you're part of the tribes. Joshua 18, verse 3, Joshua said, How long are you going to wait before taking possession of the remaining land that God of your ancestors has given you? How long are you going to wait to put down roots? How long are you going to wait to build fences and build a home for people that you can dwell there and you can raise children, you can have a legacy? How long are you going to wait, says Joshua? How long are you going to wait, says God? You know what God's put in your heart. Maybe it's time to occupy that territory. And finally, for all of us, in the end of Joshua, there's a call for us publicly to establish monuments. In Joshua 24, verse 24, the people responded to Joshua. You, you remember this passage? Some of you will have seen this printed on a plaque in your grandparents' lounge, or maybe it's in your lounge, you know. Choose this day, Joshua says, whom you will serve. It's in Joshua 24. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So on the back of that, on the back of that, the people said to Joshua, we'll serve the Lord our God. We will obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations. Joshua recorded all these things. And as a reminder of their agreement, he took a huge stone, a monument, and he rolled it beneath the tree beside the tabernacle. And Joshua said to the people, this stone, this is remarkable. I, I still don't understand this. This stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. Someone will explain to me that later. But it will be a witness. It will be a witness to testify. That's what a monument is. It's what we agreed. It's what we believe. And we put it out there to say we have committed to it. Here's my point. Establishing monuments is our responsibility to point other peoples to God's goodness. We will establish monuments in this city that will point to Jesus Christ as the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And we will be a witness to that. And we will stand next to it and say, our God is faithful to us, and he wants to be faithful to you. So I've been thinking about my personal response. And I wanted to just to share a couple of things with you. But the, you see, the advantage is for me, I've had a lot longer to think about this. Because the Lord started stirring this in me in October, November last year. But I asked myself, who do I want to be in the story? How will I respond? What does it mean for me to occupy? And here's what I think it means for me personally. For me, this is how I'm processing it. For me, to occupy means to take spiritual authority in the city God has planted me. To take spiritual authority in the city God's planted me. Now, you see, understand this. When I walk in authority, I get to establish the culture of heaven around me. Because I'm moving in authority of the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Now, when I get to establish the culture of God in my city, I gain influence amongst the people. And when I gain influence amongst the people, I can affect social change. Remember, it was the people who sat at the gates of authority in the old times that wrote the laws, determined who married and who divorced, and who got to pay what for which land. It's a place of influence. The gates of the city are the place of influence that you get to sit at when you establish culture. Now, this is directly in line with a mission that I gave you right at the beginning when the Lord called me, us, to come to Tiamudu in 2015. The Lord said, I want you to activate community transformation. So I see my role in that mission is to open doors for us to walk through so that we get to make a positive difference in our community, so that we get to make a positive difference in our community. My role is to establish our influence so that we can bring solutions that positively contribute to the social fabric of this community that we live in. I mean, it's getting darker out there. So why don't we just turn the light up? Well, is that a good idea? Who's the light? Oh, no, no, he's not. You are. Christ in you is the hope of glory. You are the light of the world. 
because he gave you that responsibility. So that's why I just roll up my sleeves and get on with it. You know, I'm boasting about our team here, but that's why in, in 17 schools around our region, we offer free counselling to primary age children. Why? Because we care about them. How do we pay for it? We don't. The Lord does. What does that mean? It means when I walk into a school to meet with a principal, they actually like us. They want to talk to us. They want to understand not just why we do it, but they want to understand what else can we do to help. Almost 400 children have had free counselling since we started that program. But that's why we're committed to providing social housing solutions at 1310 Racecourse Road. Why? Because we, wanted, we, we processed this, but then we decided it was much better for us to show the community we were willing to give up our security so that other people could have an attractive and affordable place to live. That's more important to me. We'll work out our, our story as we go. God's got something for us. I don't worry about that. And this week, on Wednesday morning, please pray for me at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because I've got an appointment with the mayor. And the reason I've got an appointment with the mayor is because I wrote to her. And I'm going to read you what my email said. Very short. We're an active church in our community through all kinds of endeavors. And I feel your perspective will be helpful for us as we determine what other projects we might plan and prepare for. So I was wanting to chat about what needs you see in our community that are not currently being met. Why? Because when we have influence in a city, we get to affect social change. And I'll let you know how it goes. But what about you? What about you? Surely I'm not the only one that God's called to do this. What's your mission in the promised land? Your, your, your promise is your mission. Now, if you don't know what the promise is, you better go back to square one. And that's not a criticism. That's, a, that's the best place to go. Because whenever I get lost or confused, I go back to square one and say, God, what did you say? What is it that you have said? We've got to, we've got to, we've got to finish with a, with a complete dependence on who God is and what he wants to do in us. And I believe God wants to reveal that to you for you as part of a community, as part of a faith community that wants to be active in our community. So I want to get you to stand. Um, as I've shared with you uh, lately, um, we're not so much doing older calls at the moment, but we're having personal response time. And so what I'm creating right now is a space for you to have a conversation with God, or at least, why don't I say it this way? I'm creating space for you to prepare your heart so you can have a conversation with God. And we're going to do that new song again, Trust in God. And uh, we're going to do it because uh, it's a good one. Uh, but also the words are a confession. The word of the song is a prayer on your lips saying, I trust in God. I trust in God. And when he speaks, I will listen. And I know he is faithful. So let's go.